Uh, now, with a great pleasure, I open this first international exchange with Cass Holman, introducing also our colleague uh, Juan Claudio Monterrubio, professor of the Tecnologico de Monterrey, which will moderate the question and answer with Professor Holman. I would only like to thank uh, Cass and her presentation. Uh, the title of her speech is Designing Gender, and Cass is Associate Professor at the Department of Industrial Design of the Rhode Island School of Design, and she also President and Designer of Heroes Will Rise. And so, Cass, <laughs> thank you for being here, and sorry for the delay of the starting of your speech. Ah, no, that was no delay. Is there a clicker? There we go. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm, uh, I'm honored and really excited to be part of this conversation. Um, in particular, I'm excited to work with the students remotely and in person tomorrow and, around and see what you all are thinking around um, this very pressing topic for all of us. Uh, I think my um, presentation will be up momentarily. So um, some of the uh, I guess what, what uh, my role in all of this is and kind of how I may introduce my work uh, may not be anything new to you, but I think that what, what might be of interest is kind of trying to start to look at how as designers we can kind of give these ideas form. Um, uh, as much as I love uh, to kind of uh, think about and expand ideas, I find that the power of design is in uh, pushing them through experience. Uh, and, and kind of giving them form. So um, as we've heard, gender is not necessarily associated with the person's biological sex, but rather self-determined by them individually. Uh, and as much gender is designed, um, and as a Western social construct, uh, it has historically been binary, either male or female. Uh, so this has presented us with two options that are policed by, and I use the term policed very intentionally, cultural, religious, and uh, economic and political institutions, uh, which of course we also internalize, right? So it's internally policed as well. Uh, so even within the potential for gender to be self-determined, meaning kind of uh, decided by the individual, uh, our options are limited and become limited by our collective imagination about what it could be, right? So even within this binary, uh, and increasingly we see a lot of in-between and a lot of exploring what else it might be, um, it's still limited by that initially it was defined within this, these two options. So as a designer, uh, a queer person, a feminist, and an optimist, I believe that play is the ideal tool to experiment with identity uh, and invent a new understanding of gender, uh, both uh, in our individual and, uh, or, sorry, gender as a way of exploring both our individual and our collective selves. So, um, Essentially, uh, a lot of my work in its most simple form uh, gives children the tool in a way, and adults as well, to literally construct gender and, and see it as something that is malleable. Um, and Jean Piaget uh, said of, of play at some point, play is the answer to the question, how does anything new ever come about? Uh, and I see play both as an outcome, but primarily as a process. Uh, either in design as part of the design process, but also as part of a, a process of, of discovery um, and experience, of course. So I'm gonna kind of show what this might look like and how as designers we might begin to think about the things that we're designers, not just experientially, but kind of how they might facilitate or inspire a certain behavior in people or, or collectives. Uh, that can allow space to design our own gender and kind of engage with our identities in a way that leaves room for uh, space outside of the binary. So um, the, the kind of first theme of a lot of my work um, is the advantages of, of no instructions. So open-ended play uh, comes without instructions. There are no rules. There are no right or wrong answers. Um, it's often very collaborative because there is no defined kind of roles. Um, and of course, when there's no prescribed process, it allows for multiple outcomes, if any outcome at all. The outcome isn't necessarily um, a goal-oriented as much as a discovery-oriented process. 
And then the other part that I think is really interesting and I think quite fun is the act of figuring it out and becoming, and in particular with children, rather than feeling like they have to experience success, they get to experience figuring it out, which may not look like really getting anywhere, right? But it looks like diving in and being curious. So one example of this is a, a, something that I designed when I was at Cranbrook in, in grad school. So I encourage every, all of the master's students and undergraduate students here to uh, play and, and think big. Um, it, it was called GMO. And GMO is very intentionally um, kind of, I was calling it strangely familiar, but it's flexible and, and um, very open-ended in its form. And my goal was to uh, allow room to, for the person, the child, I, I don't like to use the term user, but the people that are playing with it to both uh, define and, and explore and imagine the identity of the object itself, as well as how to use it. So the story kind of evolves through the play. So for example, some children uh, see this as, as a, a kind of coral, um, some see it as bones or bone structures. Some might see it as an alien. So they begin to be in the habit of defining uh, and imagining the identity of a thing, right? And I think that that later in life can apply to their understanding of defining things, that it's not a story, a designated superhero, a story or a, an identity and a defined um, persona that they inherit, that someone else gives them, but it's something that they actively participate in. And so uh, over the course of three or four years, GMO found its way around the world uh, and was used in various children's museums in ways that I hadn't necessarily designed for, which to me meant that it, it, it kind of, it worked, it was a success. So everything from these kind of shadow play things uh, to wall um, installations, all interactive. And, and often when, uh, when talking to people about it, I found that, that they had very, uh, very indifferent understandings of what it was they were engaging with, where it came from, how to use it. Um, and uh, so again, at some point, um, I was uh, asked and, and the, one of the distributors that I was working with asked um, and requested colors. And so I thought about this and, and what I found in even adding color was that that defined the kind of narrowed down what GMO could be. Uh, in a way where when I made it green, it felt like it could only be algae and therefore it couldn't be bone, you know, a, a bone configuration. And, um, and when I kind of tried with these different, all these different color palettes, it became too defined and I really didn't want to be defining it at all. Um, and there was also at some point a request to put a face on it, <laughs> which is the opposite of what GMO was about. So I absolutely would not, I refused to put a face on it because again, that I'm assigning an identity. Um, and so that's been an interesting process of kind of going back and forth with what uh, the toy industry, at least, perceived the market to be capable of, right? Um, uh, in terms of thinking that children can't play with something that doesn't have an identity, right? That needs to be a superhero. It needs to be a truck or a dog. And, uh, and what we found was that, in fact, it, it not at all. Um, another example of, of some of the work that I do uh, that exemplifies the advantage of no instructions and open-ended play is um, Anji play, which is a, a region of schools in China. And the most of the day, three hours of their day is outdoors on a playground, which they don't call a playground because it's just an extension of the classroom. And they, uh, the children have full reign over anything they want to do and how they want to do it. Uh, they have these very large materials. They have ladders and planks and um, bags. And, and uh, based on time, I'm not going to show any videos, but you can find videos online if you're interested. And it's really extraordinary in barrels. And so by taking these kind of humble, very common materials that are seen throughout their lives, the, ch the children appropriate something that's not defined for them, right? So they're kind of used to looking around and understanding uh, designed objects as something that they can appropriate or use however they need to. And so it, it gives them a kind of habit of, um, of thinking outside of the defined archetype of how things are meant to be used or defined. Um, 
And so I was tasked with kind of standardizing these materials, which was a challenge because what I thought that I understood about how they might work um, and what children might be learning from them had to be balanced with uh, that they needed to still be challenging to the students and still um, uh, not, be, not be toy so much as they could be read as designed to be played with in a specific way, uh, but also of course be um, lend themselves to be played with by groups of children. So uh, I learned quite a bit in this kind of trying to find the perfect balance between designing for the children to design while also kind of trying to make a system of objects that work together. Um, and one really quick example was that, that of course, we, we couldn't actually mass produce the um, these metal drums that, that were kind of just taken out of the um, uh, waste stream because they would have been done with and cleaned up really well and painted and et cetera. But so, so I needed to kind of redesign these to become a bit more of a product. And, um, and in doing so, I thought, well, what if we also kind of expanded? What if we gave them more opportunities for ways they might use them? So by making them hollow, that, that wasn't my intention that the children would get inside and roll them around from the inside, but it was almost a question. What would happen if we did this instead? And kind of, again, designing for others to design gave them the chance to really um, kind of figure it out and explore how they might, how it might work. Um, and this is just briefly, I, uh, and maybe just a seed to plant, um, back to kind of process and, and no defined outcome, the idea of nonlinear paths and the advantage of nonlinear paths as a way of uh, winding up with, with uh, undefined outcome. So uh, Judith Butler, uh, who is a fantastic thinker and author, and I would recommend anything that, uh, that they've written for um, anyone interested in gender studies, Identities are characterized by instability, not fixed, but achieved through repeated performance of specific acts. And there are a number of things that I loved about the book Gender Trouble, but in this quote specifically, I like that, that Judith is starting to get at um, that it's not, again, it's not from one thing to another, that this transition or being trans is not about uh, yeah, transitioning from this to this, but in fact, it's all of the in between, right? So there's not, there's a, um, there's there, the, the, it's not a linear path from one thing to another, but it's about expanding that it's not even a, a path. Um, and so in this, the, uh, the kind of another example of there um, being a sort of uh, in between with play, even something as simple as giving children slopes instead of a slide, um, gives them a chance to engage their body and, and experience, say, um, adrenaline or lack of control in a way that's exciting and might be the same thing that would be experienced on, this, on a slide, right? So for example, rather than designing a swing, you could say, what's a way that we can kind of help a child experience flying or weightlessness and it opens up what you might design and where you might where you might end up in a way that might look nothing like a slide. And so in giving them things that that don't tell them how to use them again, they become familiar with the unknown. They become really fluent in exploring and testing things out. Um, and I would say again makes them um, uh, much more comfortable in exploring rather than being told how to do things. So uh, a few quick examples of uh, how open-ended, the idea of open-ended engages a playful process. So the idea of failure, of course, we talk about a lot in design and embracing failure and we love failure. Uh, and in play, failure is of course a part of it. So, you know, you could say failure is part of it. You could also say failure doesn't exist, but however you wanna frame the term failure, um, it's part of the play process. And in play, because you're not going for a defined outcome, it's absolutely part of how you're learning and, and what makes it you know, interesting and challenging. Um, and again, the idea of figuring it out. Um, and so rigamajig is uh, something that, that I designed in 2011, and it's an open-ended um, kit of parts, like many that we're familiar with. 
And um, this image I'm showing, uh, this was when I very first tested this, and it was in a, uh, it was a pop-up playground for a park in New York City called the High Line. And they, um, these two kids were playing together for a very long time, and the parents were really impressed. So I thought, okay, it's working. The kids are engaged for a long time. And I asked them uh, to tell me about what they, you know, what, what they were doing. I, I would never say to a child, what did you make? Because that implies, just that question implies that it has to be something, right? Like if you were to say somebody, what's your gender? Especially a child, they're like, but I have to choose. There's only two. There's a right and wrong answer. What do I? So in framing the question, I think is, is is a big part of it. So in saying, tell me about what you did. It, they made a. They may have shared a, an argument they had or a funny story. They may have. They may want to tell me about the thing itself, or they may talk about something else that they are working out through the process of play. But in this case, uh, the the uh, their siblings. And one of them imagined that they were making um, uh, a it was a it was a water park a spacecraft and started pointing out the places here's where the water flies out and then it turns into stars and then it flies and these are the wings. And the other something just was kind of looking at them like, like, what are you talking about? No, it's not. This is an elephant fairy and those are its wings and this is its trunk and then this is where it carries the you know, whatever. So these completely different stories of of what they were, the, the story behind the thing they were making, but they had been engaged collaboratively for over an hour, helping each other. Does this go there? Does that go there? Without even considering that they had a different narrative going on. And so again, I had a moment of like, I, I'm, I'm not a childhood psychiatrist, but I know that something really special happened there. <laughs> and I get a lot of pictures from uh, schools of the different way that they're using it in the classroom and different ways that it's engaging um, students of all ages and abilities. Um, and again, in a way where I think oh, I, I didn't design for that, but I, I, I did design for it to be used uh, in any of these ways, but none of them specifically. And then Rigamajig Jr. Um, there's were quite a few design decisions in in this that felt more uh, that felt closer to defining an identity. Some of the forms are a little more um, hinting at something like maybe this is a bird's nest, maybe this is an eye. But in doing so, I made sure that it could be not only um, a, uh, let's see, what are some examples, not only a fish tail, but also in this case, like maybe a little plant or a leaf, right? So again, leaving room, like is, is this a wing or a cloud or some other form? So trying to leave room through a, a level of abstraction so that the, the child could define it for themselves. Um, and so just briefly, um, the, the, the other advantage of, um, well, the, I framed it kind of no experts, right? So they're not being any one archetype or kind of right way to do it means that uh, the hierarchy dissolves, right? And that removes quite a bit of power from there being, uh, like we discussed, that there's some kind of, that it's inherently we're policed by both the politics and the cultural elements, as well as our own internal limitations of what we think is feasible and the limitations of our own imagination about what's possible and what we can be. So um, this is a project that I'm doing right now where similarly, uh, things are very open ended um, and trying to uh, give children a way of engaging with things that they don't know how to use or don't understand. And I'm just kind of going through this quickly, number one, because I'm currently working on it, so I'm thinking about it a lot. But one of the things that that in talking to the design students and designers here, um, the, the process of kind of sketching and again, play as our own process uh, and and kind of knowing that that rather than than defining like I am I am now coming up with a specific idea, but saying like, oh, what about this? Maybe this will work. Maybe this will work uh, allows you to move through ideas very fluidly and almost everything that I'm showing as much as I love it is no longer part of the project just because it, it didn't make sense. And so in as much as it makes it the ideas less precious and it makes the process much less um, a kind of rigid in needing to, to feel like the things once you design it, it has to be what it is rather than like letting it shift into something else. Um, so again, um, my outcome is not 
for example, to design, my goal was not to design a set of blocks. My, design, my goal was to design a way for children to uh, engage with the process that couldn't have a defined outcome. So the, you know, the, this particular set of blocks was about it falling over. You kind of can't make a specific thing, which is unlike a previous set of blocks I designed where they were designed to make specific things. So um, uh, just to say in closing that designing for others to design inspires the people you're designing for to bring their own curiosity, imagination, and identity to um, into the story and the use of the, your, the things you're designing, and that designing less allows people to engage more, um, and it can look like a mess, much like the process of becoming oneself, right? We Hopefully, many people here, if you, if you have children or if you did it yourself, you, we watch them go through phases that we maybe are glad we got through and moved through. And other times we, we see people going through a phase and we think, okay, maybe that'll stick, maybe not. It's all, it, can, it, it continues, right? So it can look like a mess, but I would argue that it's a beautiful evolving mess. Um, this is an adventure playground with cardboard boxes, and, uh, and I would argue one of the best things that you can give to children, and it is completely undesigned, unintentional. Um, and I leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you. And Claudio, I'll leave you the floor. May I? Thank you, Elena. Hi, Cass. Uh, very, very honored to, to have you here in, in Guadalajara and in our homes and in, and in Bologna. And very, very inspiring to see your work. Uh, I, have, uh, I have many questions and, and maybe too little time. So uh, uh, maybe I will just uh, start. Uh, when when this this happened in, in into your design process to, to to really look forward to a genderless design i know children and and, and play and playfulness in in, in terms of acti human activity uh, we all been through that but as a designer uh, when this all started in this to look forward to a, a, a this 100% gender free to to improve life of children and then adult people maybe too many questions but talk this through <laughs> so kind of how did i how did i come to think about this start thinking about it yes yes yeah, to, to yeah. How, how this all came about yeah i i mean as a i I have a very strong uh, connection to my own experiences as a child. I remember playing, uh, I, maybe everyone does, but I have very visceral memories of, of playing and of course loved play and, um, and had some quite spiritual experiences up in trees. And so uh, I think that um, I, I relate to children and what happens in play and and I very much relate to also what happens in childhood when you're told that you're not right. And so that's something that is I'm looking at you in the screen, but maybe I should. Look. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so that's something that I think we it's a responsibility of adults and designers to have respect for the people anybody that we design for, but in particular children, because it has such an impact on who they can become as adults. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that uh, as a designer, um, it, it was the kind of beginning of my design career, really, that it was, was to kind of realize that this was something that was needed um, and that I could contribute to in a way that I thought was important. And, and so, um, I don't know that's, that originally specifically, I, I, and I still don't necessarily start from a, it will be a gender neutral toy, because I don't think that needs to be the case. I do, I think about different play values. So for example, um, some children want to be uh, rowdy and climb trees and have gross motor sorts of play and other children want to have really quiet play 
and creative play and draw pictures and um, you know have uh, dolls or action figures. And I don't see that as girl play and boy play, right? And, and in fact, it's funny, somebody was talking about their um, son wanting a doll and I was like, isn't that an action figure? What's the difference between a, a, a doll and a, like, uh, I don't even know any of the, the superheroes, the superhero and a Barbie, it's the same type of play. I don't know why we think that one is for girls. So um, it, for me, it doesn't start from a place of it being gender neutral. It starts with different types of play. And I know from working with child psychologists and early uh, educators and developmental psychologists that um, that it's that many children have many different ways of playing, whether it's temporary or over the course of time, regardless of their gender. Okay, so so the, this part as as uh, play as a process, and you being also uh, an educator and professor at Growth Island. Um, which are your, your influences to your students in, uh, as, a, as, a, as a professor? Which processes do you, do you take them through to, to learn to play and design at the same time? You have a, a specific one that you can talk about? Yeah, well, when, um, and I do teach, I, I teach a class every year uh, called Design for Play. And so the students, we, they can design everything from a game to a toy to an activity. And, um, we play test constantly. And so I, before they get very far along in the process of designing the thing, we stop and we play with it. And in order to kind of play test something or prototype, explore a prototype, you have to make some version of it, right? So inherently, because it, it has to happen quickly and we know it's a prototype and it has to be good enough just to play with, there's a lot of creativity around what am I, what do I need to provide in order to test this behavior or this interaction, right? So it really takes the emphasis off of the object and it gets them thinking very early about facilitating interactions with people or interactions with their own uh, emotions or the, the, I think a lot of them are designing for adults. And I think that that's because they, they relate to a need for adults to be able to play. So in that case, I think a lot of them throughout the process are designing ways to invite grownups to play again. I think we all know how to play, we just stop letting ourselves play. So it's an interesting process of watching the students kind of reconnect with their own play in order to help others play, help others remember how to play. Um, and so that's, I, I think that the, the kind of quick testing and prototyping uh, kind of leads to a playful process and, and makes a designer less invested in a beautiful, shiny outcome object product thing. That's, that's very interesting. Um, talking about Riga Magic and, and Angie Play, and I, I, I saw the documentary on Netflix, I, I think everyone uh, did. Uh, I, I have a very, very interesting question about if you live in the United States and, and, and Angie play with all the normatives for, for children, toy and design. Uh, I think it will be very difficult to, to, to put Angie play in, in United States to in, in kindergartens, don't you think? Yeah, well, because we have security. a, we, oh, sorry, go ahead. Because of security for children and stuff like that. How do you cope with that? normativity while, while, while you design? Yeah, we, we do have a number of Anji Play pilot schools around the world and in the US. Um, okay. And we do, we kind of have to be creative about how to introduce, for example, the ladders. <laughs> and so <laughs> some of the materials that are available shift a little bit based on what's uh, possible in any given country. But for the most part, uh, Context is a really important part of of Angie Play, and what I think is an important part of design. Something that I designed for a school in Italy would be very different from something that I designed for um, a school in Chile, because there's going to be a different context. It'd be different from a school in the U.S. And even in the U.S., when I design a playground, a playground in an, in New York, in a densely urban place, is going to be very different than one 
that's next to the woods. The children have different needs and access to different things. And so um, in as much as context is important, I, I see the limitations of liability or we call it risk aversion when, when communities aren't comfortable letting their children jump off of a ladder. Um, so those kind of become constraints and some of them we try to kind of work through or coach people toward being comfortable with. Um, and others, other times those constraints create totally new opportunities of, of an object that makes sense for the, the child to play with or the children, the, the group, the community to play with. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you think that is it possible to have a 100% gender-free design in the future? Well, I mean, uh, bodies have different needs. So I, I don't think that, that it would be gender-free. And also I think gender is really fun. I think that we can play with it and like I said, like it, it doesn't have to be fixed. It can be something that we express differently at different points in our lives. Um, and so I would like that to be not, a, not, not something that's used to police our gender, right? I think that design, even if unintentionally, um, it, and it's not just in toys. When you go into stores, there's a men's department and a women's department, right? Anywhere you go to a website, it starts with often, what do you, whose shoes do you want? Men's, women's. And I'm like, it's, there's a universal size. Why does it, it uh, and so, um, so I think that those, again, unconsciously are policing us all the time in a way that's not, absolutely not necessary. So I don't think it should be without gender. I love it when, people who, who you know, want to express extreme femininity or, or different levels of anything in between. I just don't think it has to have anything to do with their um, personal parts. Thank you, very, very, very promising. Uh, I don't know, Elena, if, if we open the, the, the question to the floor there in Bologna, so maybe some, some of your students and people around are eager to, to ask something.